This time on the show, phone freaking. No, not getting free long distance, rather we're diving into the intricacies of the public switch telephone network with pulse amplitude modulation and pulse code modulation. Yeah. Yeah, hook me up, I'm ready. This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Got a great idea? It all starts with a great domain, Domain.com. Fresh books online invoicing and GoToAssist Express. Support smarter with GoToAssist Express. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly dose of techno lesson. Man, do we have a great show for you guys because between this week and next we have a sweet series. A series on something that is so near and dear to my heart. But before we get to that, I think we do need to do a little bit of life update and uh, get you guys clued in on all things Hack 5, right? Because this is an odd season, which means every other we, uh, we roll into the holidays and as such, uh, things get a little strange with scheduling and stuff like that. So I just want to let you know, hold tight because they may not be hour long shows, but we do have some fantastic topics this next week being one of those. Uh, so a little bit more on the left update side, here's what's going on with me. I'm uh, flying back this week to Virginia for Thanksgiving holidays here in the States. And uh, I'm going to be driving my Volkswagen back over to the San Francisco Bay Area while Josette and I are having a great time riding, you know, Josette's the name of my bike. Well, we're riding all over here in the SF Bay Area. It's getting a little cooler and I don't mind that, but uh, the rain is definitely an issue. Not that I have a problem riding in the rain, but uh, people here seem to not know how to drive in the rain and I don't like to be on the highway with them when they're freaking out. So, uh, that said, I'm looking forward to getting my car, looking forward to going back to, uh, to Williamsburg, Virginia and seeing some friends. Uh, Paul's gonna be there, so I'm looking forward to seeing Paul. And uh, yeah, that, that's what's going on there and seems that on my way back, I'm gonna be stopping in uh, Missouri and picking up Kirby. I know, longtime viewers of Hack5 know who Kirby is. She's uh, my little furry companion named after Kerberos, the um, handshake authentication protocol. And uh, she's gonna be here with me in the Bay Area. It's gonna be so great to have the kitty back. But you guys didn't tune in to find out about me driving across the country or sniffing Wi-Fi while I'm doing that or picking up a cat. You want to know about this week's Technolust. And as I said, near and dear to my heart, we are talking about phone freaking. Yeah. So the phone hacking scene been going on since the 60s and uh, well, when I got into it in the 90s, everything was all digital, but there's still a lot of fun to be had. And no, right off the bat, we are not talking about how to get free long distance. I mean, really, with voice over IP and everything, free phone calls is like the last of your concerns. In fact, when I get into phone freaking, well, that may have been an allure at the very beginning. I was really just fascinated with the public switch telephone network. And there's something really cool about, especially at a very young age, I mean, we're talking like, you know, 12, 13, 14, getting intimately familiar with things like pulse amplitude modulation, pulse code modulation, time division multiplexing, and things like that. <laughs> And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about this week and next. So I figured, I don't know, let, let's break it down, right? Now I say when I got into all of this, everything was digital, right? But uh, it wasn't always so. And I figured, why don't we just go ahead and talk about the analog so that we can totally respect where we've come, uh, how far we've come, and the, uh, the digital pots that we live in now. Uh, P-O-T-S, plain old telephone system. All right, we're just going to define acronyms on the fly. Um, so I have right here a handset. This is actually one made by Harris Strachan and uh, very similar to one of the ones that I um, may have obtained when I was a lot younger. I can pick up one of these off eBay for like 40 bucks or so. And this is really just the, uh, the commercial equivalent of a beige box. You've got your tip and your ring. You can use it to plug it into a telephone box. You get a dial tone, you call China, you have fun. Um, but how does all, all happen, right? So let's just break it down. When I actually speak into this microphone here, what I'm doing is I'm making a metal diaphragm that's got carbon fiber or carbon bits in it uh, vibrate. And what that does is it produces a waveform, right? It actually creates some resistance on the electrical signal that's going through there. It creates some variation in the current. And that right there is our analog signal. That's actually what travels between your twisted pair your, your red and your black, or I guess it's your green and your black, or I'm forgetting exactly the colors, but the, you know, the two copper wires that go to the central office and then through some fun switching systems 
go to your other friend's central office and then they get routed to their house and then you can talk, right? But what happens though is in the analog world, we get this, uh, we get this waveform here, right? And this waveform just gets, uh, you know, every 6,000 feet, it needs to get amplified because it gets all like, and it gets all nasty, right? Well, before the digital era, that just got nastier and nastier and nastier. And if you were to go calling from San Francisco here to, you know, St. Louis, yes, that's supposed to be the gateway arch, uh, it's not going to sound that great. So thankfully, we have digital technologies where we can, uh, where we can do some fun signaling, we can do some encoding and multiplexing, and we can send things out over, you know, right here, for example, over to a satellite, bounce it back down over to another one, or over here on like, uh, this is my rendition of the Sutro Tower over microwave links, line of sight, probably wouldn't happen between San Francisco and St. Louis. Still, we can take all of those and rather than, you know, over copper on an analog circuit, we can actually send them over various mediums and it just allows the, uh, the telephone networks to be able to save a lot of money without having to, you know, run so many lines. So that's kind of the topics for this week. We're going to be talking about signaling. We're going to be talking about encoding. We're going to be talking about multiplexing. And I hope you guys enjoy it. We're going to be using the telephone network as our example here. But really, a lot of these concepts apply to more than just telephone switching. So while I am talking about you know, signaling and digital processing and, and multiplexing and stuff, I'm going to take kind of a high level overview approach here because so many of these apply to different fields. And, uh, you know, the phone system is just near and dear to my heart. So we're just going to use that as our example. And I hope you guys enjoy that. So it, it translates and it's, you know, this isn't going to be an exhaustive uh, lesson in the PSTN. I'm not going to get so much into the variations between D1 and D4 framing of a T1 link because, well, that's really, really cool. It really only applies to, you know, that certain specification of a, uh, of a T1. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoy. I hope you guys have some questions because we will be doing a follow-up episode. Uh, but for right now, I figured uh, with all of that painted, a little overview, if you will, let's take a quick break, check in with Shannon, and we get, when we get back, we're going to be talking about pulse amplitude modulation. How's that for a tease? Last week's trivia question was, since version 4.0, this open source servlet container features components such as Coyote and Jasper. And the answer was Apache Tomcat. If you want to win some Hack5 swag this week, Go over to hack5.org slash trivia and answer this question. Created by Larry Ewing in 1996, this aquatic flightless bird is mascot to what family of Unix-like operating systems? We'll be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. Hey, you want to talk about it? No. Come on, I'm listening. I just feel really bad about letting you burn. I just didn't want you to make the wrong decision about your web hosting. It's okay. I went with Domain.com. They have hosting plans starting at just $5.75 a month. And the Hack5 viewers get an extra 15% off when they check out with coupon code Hack5. So what are you making there? Well, I'm making apology soup for you. What's in it? Well... So far, just onions. Domain registration and hosting is nothing to cry over. With Domain.com, hosting plans start at just $5.75 a month, and their deluxe offering includes unlimited bandwidth and site builder pages. See how easy it is to get dependable, flexible, and affordable hosting at Domain.com. Check out with coupon code HAK5 and save an additional 15%. Got a great idea? It all starts with a great domain. Domain.com. So we're back. We've got our Pinot Grigio in hand. Well, you know, because we're talking about phone freaking and... Were you thinking we'd mix a red wine with phone freaking? Come on, dude. That's more for like bash scripting. Anyway, it's time to talk about pulse amplitude modulation. It's really just a form of signal processing. So let's get it all down. Now pulse amplitude modulation in the instance of uh, the telephone system is the first step in our process of taking that analog signal and converting it into a digital one so that we can multiplex it and finesse it and switch it and convert it to this and that and the other thing. And, um, and really it's just a matter of taking, like we said, that, uh, that sine wave there, that, uh, that analog waveform when we 
you know, speak into our telephone headset here and create that uh, variation in the current. So say like we've got a waveform that looks like this. So we need to take that and we need to make it digital. And pulse amplitude modulation is going to help us do that. Like I said, it's a signal processing technique. And in this case, uh, or at least in the case of the telephone network, it's going to work at 8,000 hertz or 8 kilohertz, right? And what that means is how many times, and in this case, we're just going to say per second, we are going to sample this waveform. So let's just draw this out, right? So we've got our waveform. This is time. And this right here would be our bit depth, OK? And in this case, it's an 8-bit depth, right? So an 8-bit number, which is from 0 to 255. And that's how we get 8 bits in a binary. We'll get to that real soon. But uh, we're just going to put 0 down here and 128 here in the center and say 255 there, OK? So this waveform here can any, be anywhere between 0 and 255, and that's how we're going to represent it digitally. But we're going to need to make a sample of that every, well, in this case, 8,000 hertz, 8,000 times per second. We'll just say that to be easy. And that's going to look essentially like this. So we're going to sample this right here, and then eight, you know, every 8,000 times, we're just going to make all these little samples. And we're going to say, hey, awesome little waveform. What exactly would your digital representation be? If I had to convert you know, the, uh, your variation in current, you know, whatever your, your, your voltage difference that has been created by the pressure that a human voice exerts you know, over the air, causing a little piece of uh, carbon to vibrate and make fluctuations and, uh, and some current, right? if I had to sample that 8,000 times a second, what would I get? What number would you be? I'm going to assign a number to you. That's going to be fun, right? So let's, uh, I don't know, let's take this one for example, right? So at this point in time right here, we're going to say, hey, what does this waveform equal? And we're just going to say, I don't know, 173 is what that's going to be. So we've got that number, 173. And to give you an example, you know, we we're talking about 8,000 times per second. That right there is, or 8,000 hertz, that right there is what the telephone network uses. However, you see these frequencies a lot more in, in any sort of analog to digital conversion. For example, in CD audio, that would actually be 44,100 hertz. So to give you a, an example difference, you know, this is, this is phone, and that's CD. It's a huge difference in the fidelity, but you know, you would think, oh man, that must sound like junk, right? Well, actually, it's been you know, some scientists have kind of come up with the idea that actually anything over 800 hertz is uh, is your bare minimum for human understandability. Is that a word? We're gonna go with that, right? Uh, which leads me to believe that uh, that GSM and CDMA must use 400. Joking, joking, but. Uh, but all that aside, really, um, 8,000 shouldn't be that bad. And to be honest, uh, a landline telephone doesn't sound all that bad for, for 8,000 hertz, right? Uh, and then you'll see other ones like, like I don't know, 48,000 or 48 kilohertz. And that's what you would see on like a DVD. And um, even Blu-ray would go up to 96,000 hertz, right? In fact, I think it can even go up to 192 hertz on a Blu-ray. But I haven't seen it. So anyway, that right there kind of gives you an idea of, of where this all sits, at least in comparison to the telephone network, right? So when we do that, when we make all of these samples, and we make all these samples with an 8-bit depth and assign them a number between 0 and 255, uh, we're going to have to you know, um, convert those to binary. And, uh, and that right there is essentially what pulse amplitude modulation is all about. It's just about taking that, that, digital, that analog signal here and converting it into a digital one. So it really looks you know, more like, uh, instead of the sine wave here, it would be like, eh, 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 you know. And that right there is our aliasing. It's not beautiful, but it's enough 
to effectively take that so that we can transmit it over a digital medium and then reconstruct it on the other side, play it out a speaker, and as far as a human ear is concerned, it sounds like sound. Yeah, we're going to go with that. So with all of that said, we're going to be back in just a bit. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about pulse code modulation and how we convert this over to binary and send it across the network so that you can hear your person on the other end. If you're a creative professional or an IT consultant such as myself, you'd probably rather rebuild a Windows 98 box than do invoicing. Or at least that's how I felt until I met our newest sponsor, FreshBooks. Their online invoicing system is the easiest ever. It gets you paid quicker and makes you look so professional. Seriously, accepting credit cards, PayPal, Google Checkout, they'll even print and mail your invoice to your client. That is so cool. And it's so easy to get started. It's free to sign up. Just go over to freshbooks.com and they're doing the coolest thing just for Hack5 viewers. If when you sign up, you enter in Hack5 in the section where you hear about us, they're going to go ahead and every day send one of those entries a birthday cake. That's awesome. It doesn't even have to be your birthday to win. So you could do whatever you want with your birthday cake. Like mine. I mean, I've always wanted to do this. So yeah, check out Fresh Books. Mmm. All right, so we understand pulse amplitude modulation. It's the first step of converting this all to digital. And the next phase here, at least in the PSTN or in the public switch telephone network, is to do a little fun thing called pulse code modulation. Now pulse code modulation, or G.711 as per the ITU-T specification, is a, is just, it's a, a waveform code. It's, in fact, it's a very common method of transforming a waveform into a digital signal. You're going to see it everywhere, from CD audio to DVDs to just about anything that requires converting audio into digital. Um, and in the United States, the version that we use is actually called U-Law. I think that's backwards. No, it's not. Where, and, and that right there is North America, which is all like, uh, and then there's this thing, and then, oh, hey, there's Texas, and then California. And, oh, wait, that's right. America's hat. And then we've got Sarah Palin, and then a little couple of islands. And that, that's good. Oh, there's a big lake right there. Um, yeah, so that's U-Law, right? Actually, it also encompasses these guys, which are Japan. Right. Whereas A-Law is basically Europe and the rest of the world. And no, I'm, I'm not going to go there, sorry. I'm not going to subject you to my drawings of Europe and the rest of the world. You're welcome. Um, but those are really just designations. They're specifications. They're, they're really, at the, at the end of the day, they're just the, the protocol, just slight differences in the way that this works because really at, they, they still use the same technology here, the pulse amplitude modulation to sample this and give it a number value and then encode it. Um, so we're not too worried about the particulars there. Like I said, just kind of a, an overview, kind of introduce you to some of these concepts. For those of you born past the fall of the Berlin Wall, I have no idea about any of this. And, um, and yeah, let's get down to it. So I'm going to have to make a little bit of room here, so let's, let's get rid of some of this waveform, okay? So we've converted our analog signal here, our, our blue line, in, and we've gotten a, uh, a digital representation of it, a binary number, of, well, a number that we're going to convert into binary, if you will. We've sampled 8,000 times per second, and now it's time to uh, create a binary stream out of it, okay? So in this example, this 173, well, that's actually going to be represented as an 8-bit byte. So 8,000 times per second, 8-bit byte. And that right there is going to look like, well, in the, the case of uh, 173, that's 10101101. Now, how did we get that? Pretty much like this. So let's take binary and we're going to do it from right to left. One, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight. If we add all of these up, what are we going to get? We're going to get two fifty-five. And of course, 
when you're talking about binary math, you always start with a zero, in which case there are actually 256 uh, positions, if you will, right? There's 256 possibilities there. And, uh, and we can create a number anywhere between zero and 255 and express it as an eight bit byte using that method. And we're not gonna get into hex or any of that fun stuff, but essentially this number here, when we sampled it one of those, one of the times in the 8,000 Hertz, right? And it was 173, we can express it as 173 is one plus, uh, let's see, actually I'll just put it out this way. One, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. So if we took 128 plus 32 plus eight plus four plus one, we would get 173. So there we go, we've converted our analog uh, wave here to a uh, digital number or to a, to a decimal and then we've converted that decimal over to a eight bit binary number. And now we can put that eight bit binary number into a stream and when we transmit it over, and still over an analog medium, in this case we're still talking about copper, what it's going to look like rather than this is, where do I have some room, is uh, it's going to look like this. So, one, zero, one, zero, one, uh-oh, we've got two ones consecutively, watch this, one, zero, one. Now, now what are those numbers? What, what does this mean? Well, what does this crazy form look like? This is a zero, this is plus three, and this is minus three. And what we're talking about there is volts. We're actually gonna send that over the line. And what's gonna happen is when we send this over the line, and this is just a digital representation of this right here, this binary stream, this one zero one zero one one zero one, right? We've sent it as these pulses of positive three, zero, negative three, zero, positive three, negative three, zero, positive three, right? That right there is eight bits in voltage across a wire. Now we alternate that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's actually going to make that signal a lot stronger. Second of all, if we didn't do that, what would happen is say we're transmitting this across our, uh, our neighborhood here. We, we got to get back to the central office, right? I'm on the phone talking to my friend, my voice creating, you know, variations in the, the pressure, right? Causing that little uh, coil to vibrate, creating a uh, analog waveform, goes down the street to a little box that you can get into with an 11 millimeter uh, socket wrench, but beware because there's a little switch that you have to push up at the top and that lifts the central office that you're not breaking in. Probably more than you need to know. Don't get in trouble. We're gonna leave it there. Um, what that's gonna do is that there's a box that's gonna take that and it's gonna digitize it as we've talked about here. It's gonna multiplex it and we're gonna talk about that next week and then it's gonna ship it over to the central office as a bunch of ones and zeros and it's gonna look like this. But that central office, and that's so far away. Eventually this signal is going to degrade, right? And what it's gonna look like is something like this. It's gonna be like, ooh, okay. And then it's gonna come down, right? And what happens is, say every 6,000 feet, a little over a mile or so, um, there's going to be what's known as a rectifier. Now a rectifier, uh, back in the analog days, this would have been an analog amplifier that would have taken that sine wave, that would have taken that, that analog source and just boosted it up a bit so that you know, it still maintains good signal strength, right? Well, if you do that with an analog line, and we were calling here from like San Francisco to uh, St. Louis, man, that's gonna sound like junk. It really is. And, and that's why I'm so thankful for digital because what happens with these rectifiers is when it sees this signal here, like moving around like this, it's like, oh, it looks at this blue line and goes, obviously it meant to be this orange line. And it basically recreates the signal. And that's so cool about digital that we can do that. Well, if we were to, instead of using positive three and negative three, if we were just to say do, I don't know, uh, one, zero, um, Wow, my pen is dying. Here, let's, let's try another color. Pink, there we go. So if we we're gonna go one, zero, one, zero, one, what, what, what are we doing here? One, zero, right? How would it know when, you know, when, that, when that line, you know, when over, over a mile or so, over those twisted pair of copper wires that you see stringing along your street, when that, uh, when that gets there, it might look like this, and then the signal processor may not 
take a look at that and may not recognize that as two consecutive ones. So, you know, plus three and minus three volts is going to uh, allow it to have a, uh, you know, a stronger signal strength and also let the rectifier just have a better uh, chance of recreating that signal so that when it gets to the, the central office that they can read it and uh, retransmit it and send along and charge away too much for your long distance and all that other fun stuff that goes along with telephony, right? So, yeah, I know that that right there is, uh, is going to, uh, to create a lot of questions. I hope that you send those to feedback at hack5.org. Next week, we're going to be talking about what a DS0 is and how that is uh, important when it comes to transmitting this over T1 links. And just to give you a little hint, we've got 8,000 hertz, 8-bit bytes, right? And what that comes out to is... 64,000 or 64 kilobits per second, which as we know goes into a T1, which is 1.544 megabits per second, 24 times. A little bit of multiplexing teasing, if you will. So yeah, anyway, send your feedback to feedback at hack5.org. I look forward to your questions. Next week, we're going to be talking about the intricacies of T1 slash E1 links, as well as uh, time division multiplexing, and maybe even touching on a little bit of code division multiplexing and uh, frequency division multiplexing. And wow, multiplexing. Who knew it could be so much fun? Anyway, uh, at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and thank one of our excellent sponsors. And when we get back, we're going to be wrapping up with Shannon. Thanks much. If you work with clients and colleagues to resolve computer issues, I have an incredible remote support tool that'll make you look like a hero while saving you time and money and boosting productivity. GoToAssist Express, brought to you by Citrix, lets you easily resolve computer issues in real time or after hours while your customers are away from their computers, allowing you to be more productive. In fact, on average, GoToAssist Express users report a 40% increase in productivity. That's like getting two extra work days back a week. Hack5 viewers can try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit gotoassist.com slash hack5. That's gotoassist.com slash hak5 for a free trial. If you think you've got the Technoless like Okiwan, he made this TV Begone kit inside of an Altoids can, which I think is total Technolust. Make sure to email all your photos over to feedback at hack5.org and perhaps we will show yours next week. Also, we just restocked our store for the holidays with everything from hoodies, t-shirts, hats, stickers, and pineapples, everything you could want, we have in stock for the holidays. So go over to hack5.org slash store and pick up your favorite swag. And don't forget the fastest and easiest way is always to subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Until next week, I'm Shannon Morse. Remember to trust your technolust. And you just lost the game. I'm sorry, it was right there. I lost it. I can't. Sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs>freaking of the 90s and, and that's really where I come from in the scene and uh, this is just one of those things where I am rambling and I'm probably gonna retake this shot but I'm gonna be talking because I really have no clue so there we go and that right there is how you do an outtake yeah not so much and no we're not gonna be talking about how to get you a free long distance we're actually gonna be talking about why they don't oh, damn it need to figure out what the hell I'm saying before I start saying it, don't I? Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly... Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. That sounded weird. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. This is your weekly dose of Technolust. And for some reason I can't get through the intro part. So, uh, as you guys know, I am... I am, as, as I say, as you guys know, as if you would know, but you don't know because I haven't told you yet. I'm about to tell you. Why am I doing this? I don't know. We're just going to try this again. All right, cool.